Good Wednesday morning. I'm Tyler Keeft in the studios of 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV. This is the Oakland County Megacast. Today, as always, we're broadcast on Civic Center TV and Birmingham Area Municipal Access on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99, as well as on 89.3 Lakes FM and lakesfm.com and on 88.1 the Biff out of Bloomfield Hills. Today, in addition, on Facebook Live, our Facebook partner of the day is the West Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce, and you can join us Friday morning before the Megacast at 8 a.m. for their 2021 installation of board officers. As always, from our home studio, I am joined by Ronnie Dahl. Hey, uh, Tyler, a happy Wednesday to you. We have made it uh, a full week here, uh, January 13th, here in the new year, and one week after the Stun Nation watched the rioters attack the nation's capital, the U.S. House of Representatives has begun proceedings to try to impeach President Donald Trump for a second time. This after Vice President uh, Pence yesterday did in fact now announce that he would not be seeking to invoke the 25th Amendment against Trump. We are in historic times right now. I was just uh, in the living room watching a little bit of the proceedings. It's just really a bit unbelievable, uh, Tyler, that this is going on. Yeah, it's it's certainly unprecedented times in our country's history, uh, having a president that is very likely going to be impeached by the House of Representatives for the second time, something that has never happened Uh, To any other U.S. president, nobody has been impeached more than once before, and uh, that's likely to be complete completed today. Uh, There's a there's not necessarily a a large chance, but there's not necessarily a small chance that he could also then be convicted in the Senate. May not happen before his presidency ultimately expires on January 20th, but. Uh, this is history in the making. I, I have it here uh, on, on my computer screen. I'm monitoring it just in case there are any major developments uh, while our show goes on. But th- definitely some historic times we're dealing with here. Uh, and a lot has changed in just about one week uh, after the attacks at the U.S. Capitol. So we are waiting because we are going to be uh, bringing in Andy Levin. He is the U.S. Representative for Michigan's 9th Congressional District. He'll be joining us shortly here on the Megacast. And as soon as we get him, uh, we will be jumping to his interview. But in the meantime, too, the other big news that's going on here in the state of Michigan, Tyler, has to do with uh, the Flint water crisis. They are expecting that. Uh, later today, formal charges are going to be filed against uh, the former governor, Rick Snyder, and up to 10 members of his administration in connection with the Flint water disaster. Some of those charges, while we will not know until it is formal in the court, we are hearing those charges could include up to involuntary manslaughter. Yeah, and it's going to be a number of officials from uh, the from Governor Snyder's previous administration here in the state of Michigan, including the former governor, uh, that will likely be charged in those in that case. As you know, th- this is not something that just went away with a new administration or went away with time and with a reversal of those in hindsight and really in foresight at the time poor decisions, uh, but. It's going to be a huge story here in Michigan going forward as these officials, as, the, as these former former government officials and the former governor of our state uh, come under fire for a, an incredible tragedy and a, an issue that really was preventable in the city of Flint. I, and, but I do also wonder how much politics is playing into uh, some of these charges and these sure. decision making as well, because obviously we're talking about a Republican administration versus a Democratic uh, administration and how much money was spent under the Snyder administration to even get to this point to bring some of these charges and then when dana nessel was brought into the office they kind of dropped that investigation and started the investigation anew and there hasn't been a lot of transparency has been the complaint from many people especially some of the people in flint about the procedures getting up to this point however another historic day not only in our nation's capital but also for the state of michigan as well if indeed we do start to see some of those charges coming down it could be today could be tomorrow 
but we'll have to wait and see. But for the people of Flint, it is long overdue. Yes, yes, they've been waiting for answers for many years, long enough, far and beyond long enough uh, for people to, for people in power or who were in power to answer for the decisions that were made that ultimately poisoned a great number of people, including children in the city of Flint. So we are just learning that uh, the Representative Levin is not going to be able to make it onto the show due to the impeachment hearings. Uh, we uh, understand, <laughs> however, it, it, it's one of those things that happen with politicians. You kind of wonder, uh, do they not have a calendar and a time a clock like we do? <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, no, when you're supposed what, to be the, on air with us, is not a good time to tell us that. But yeah, well, I mean, the, cl the clocks, the clocks has impeachment time. That's exactly. So it's we do proceeding. understand yeah, that, uh, but it, we do want to say that we'll try to get him on. Uh, a little bit dur uh, during the week as well. I know that I believe we have Brendan Lawrence on with us uh, tomorrow. And so I don't know if anyone had been following some of their social media throughout uh, the riots and the attack that happened on the nation's capital last week. And you can see some of the things that they were going through, but also we would like to get their firsthand account of the proceedings and what's taking place and how this is going to you know, continue. Uh, down the road, because uh, you know there is also some argument about obviously you're not going to be able to remove the president before his term is up next Wednesday. So what is the point of the impeachment? And 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 we saw before there was an argument that everyone was so uh, focused on the um, the hearings the last time that the coronavirus and this pandemic that was just in its beginning stages was kind of overlooked as to what was happening in other countries. And yet it, it landed on our, our doorstep. So some people are saying, hey, shouldn't we kind of be focusing instead on uh, the pandemic that we're still in the middle of and trying to bring this to an end because he's going to be out of office in a week anyway. Yeah, that's kind of my question too is I, I'm, my take on this is you're in the last days of his presidency. Certainly, certainly those involved in this have to end in this attack on the Capitol, including those that may have, whether directly or indirectly, incited that violence and incited that really insurrection at the Capitol. They should answer for that. However, we're at the end of his presidency. Every single eye in the country is on the president, including the vice president's eye, including the eyes of Congress, they're not going to be, there's no, no true way really to make a misstep without being immediately answered. People within the administration, those in the military have said that certain orders, if they were, if they went beyond the boundary of what would be of, of reason, that they would not be followed. So a, a week left in the presidency, it doesn't really seem like that's a great time to go through with these proceedings because it is coming to its it is coming to its end. I think the biggest goal here isn't necessarily to remove him from office. It would be to prevent him from running for federal office again, which is another caveat of that of that impeachment should he be convicted in the Senate. Yes, it, well, and that is one of the things the Senate can't even get um, it, you know, the measure to even take up this issue until the president is officially out of office. So there is some talk there about uh, why even go through with it, but it's it's what you just said. It's so that he can't run for office again in the future because some people are saying, hey, he may run again in 2024. So um, so many things still playing out here across the country, uh, here in the state of Michigan as well. As we continue on, it's still just unbelievable what we witnessed last week. And we want to remind people, though, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people at the protest last week. But you have to remember, too, there were a lot of people there who were taking part in a peaceful protest. And, it, you know, they were maybe they were not necessarily a part of the riot 
and the siege on the nation's capital. And so there is a difference there, just like the riots that we saw unfold across the country um, this past summer. There were people that were there for the peaceful protests and to have their First Amendment right, exercising that amendment and having their voices heard. And then there were also the ones that were doing criminal acts and looting and breaking into stores. And that is the same case here on the nation's capital as well, because there is a big push right now to try to identify so many of the people that were at the events last week. But there is also a difference between people that were actually in the Capitol and ones that were outside the Capitol there for the actual protest. Yeah, there were people that were there to speak their minds, to have their voices heard, to raise questions about the election, whether those questions had any standing or not, and and all evidence at this point is pointing toward it, they don't. And then there were people that went there with the intent of doing harm, and there's been more indication as time has gone on that there was some form of organization to the invasion of the Capitol, and other people, of course, participate in the heat of the moment, good decision or not, and it was a very, very bad decision, and it was extremely harmful. Um, but there, there are many of those we're also seeing on a positive light, a split now where there, is some pe- there are some people that were sympathi- sympathetic, I would say, maybe. And that's maybe not the greatest choice of words with those on the fringes of that belief that the election was stolen and that the Congress, it, and that the Congress it has gone rogue and, and so on and so forth. And they're now, we're now sort of seeing some of the people in the moderate portions of the right, as we've seen b- before on moderate portions of the left veer away from some of those fringes in kind of an awakening moment after that horrible event last week, Wednesday, at the U.S. Capitol. Uh, One of the hard things about this conversation, though, about people that did attend the rally, because now some employers, we are finding out that there were a lot of people that were involved, uh, prior military or current military individuals, along with law enforcement, first responders, firefighters, people of that nature that were there. Um, And some people are starting to lose their jobs because they did, in fact, attend. But we have to remember there is a difference between your First Amendment right and attending a protest and attending a rally and actually breaking the law. And that's what I think so many of these employers are going to be starting to look at. Did you cross the line? And we've seen this play out as well um, just from social media posts. You may be posting on your own personal page, but if you post something that could bring a negative light to your employer or to your organization, people are losing their jobs over that. Yeah, and you know, if, if, you're, if you're an at-will employee and you work for an at-will employer, they have any right that they see fit to say, hey, you, you do not represent what we want to represent at our company uh, if you were participating in the in those events that being said there is a difference between people that were that were there to attend the pro the protest and speak their mind and those that were there to speak their mind in a in an antisocial and harmful way as we saw happen on the steps of the capitol and certainly inside the building and Um, So there's probably going to be some cases coming up in in the next few months of people that have been terminated from the work for simply attending the for simply attending the uh, events at the Capitol in in protest or or on Capitol Hill in protest versus those in comparison there with those cases of people that are are being terminated from the work because they participated in the rioting and, and in the invasion of the U.S. Capitol that saw people fearing for their lives as many were being attacked and many who were the attackers looking for people to harm. So uh, with that, if we can go ahead and uh, maybe jump into some of the day's headlines with that, Tyler, uh, indoor dining likely to not reopen until February 1st. Now, if you remember, the mandate was uh, set to expire this coming Friday, that is not going to be happening. An association that represents bars and restaurants in Michigan says it expects Governor Gretchen Whitmer is going to be announcing today a plan to allow indoor dining to resume, but not until February 1st. Michigan Licensed Beverage Association posted on Facebook Tuesday that the February 1st plan will give owners time to work with their supply chains and figure out staffing plan will likely include limited capacity as well as a curfew. Indoor dining at bars and restaurants 
has been suspended in Michigan since November 18th amid the surge in the COVID-19 infections. The state's most recent epidemic order closed indoor dining through Friday. The state reported 21,955 new coronavirus cases last week. The total was up from the previous week, but still well below the 50,892 cases reported the week of November 15th through 21st, the week the governor initially closed indoor dining at bars and restaurants. Remember back then, uh, she said it was going to be for three weeks. Well, that didn't happen. And this is one of the issues that we have uh, I think everyone has with some of our elected leaders during this pandemic, because if we go all the way back to March, it was originally for two weeks to flatten the curve. And then it was four weeks to flatten the curve. Here we are nearly a year later, and this is still happening. And I think this is where the issue of trusting our elected leaders comes in. Why not say we are setting this as a target date However, we are going to monitor the situation past that. So November 18th, it was supposed to be for three weeks. They extended it till uh, then it was going to be this Friday. And now they're saying the first. So the governor is expected to have a press conference today. Yes. And one of the things she's going to be basically saying, again, it's, a, a, it's to allow the uh, restaurant owners to be able to um, go through the process of being able to reopen their businesses. Um, I, it, that didn't seem to be an issue in some of these earlier mandates. It seems to be one now they're trying to put a positive spin on it, uh, but that's going to be uh, expected to uh, be announced today. And for some businesses though, Tyler, uh, that two weeks can make the difference between keeping your doors open and having to close your business for good. Yeah, uh, it's 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 going to be extremely detrimental to, to some of these businesses and their ability to survive or continue their operations or reopen at all. Those two weeks in time is, is a lifetime for some of these businesses. That uh, that being said, I, th I think on the on the on on the issue of the three weeks initially, <laughs> and then now it's been almost three months at this point is by the time that they will be reopening is yeah you know you can set that benchmark and say hey we're aiming for three months out to have or four months out to have everything fully reopened in your indoor dining and, and restaurants and bars businesses and that's just going to tick a lot of people off in the industry saying you're shutting us down for three whole months and so they try to balance that out by saying we're going to go three weeks we're going to see what happens if it's good after three weeks we'll gradually reopen if it's not good after three weeks we'll continue it on and then you have continuation after continuation after continuation and that also ticks people off it's a it's a damned if you do damned if you don't situation the fact of the matter is COVID 19 cases have still been a major issue in the state of michigan since the onset of that major spike back in november just be uh, uh, just before and through the thanksgiving holiday it still is an issue now even as we're rolling out the vaccines it's contributed to the vaccinations being slower than initially expected and planned to be done because the medical community has to focus so much of their energy and expertise on combating COVID-19 cases, but also on the other side of that, statistics have, there's been plenty of statistics that have shown that restaurants and bars have not been a major impact area for COVID-19, for COVID-19 outbreaks and, and cases, but with people's aversion to wearing masks and keeping their distancing and, and following these guidelines, we've seen cases continue to rise. So there's a balancing act throughout the entire process of this, but that being said, yeah, the PR angle of it definitely being dropped uh, on the government side, which should really not be all too much of a big surprise. Well, and I think some of the restaurant owners are going to argue that we didn't contribute to the rise. You, that was travel. You haven't put the same bans on traveling. Uh, and while you have you know, indicated and suggested people should not gather during the holidays, they obviously did, which helped increase the surge. So why are they paying for the bad behavior of other people or other industries that uh, also didn't have to go through this. I, I don't know if you've been to the mall lately, but the food courts are open. Right. Well, they've taken oh, the and, tables and that's, out that's and you horrible. can't, but, but why can I eat in a food court or in the mall, but I can't eat in a restaurant? So there are so many different angles yes. to this argument. Um, but the good news is there's a little bit of hope on the horizon. 
uh, February 1st, obviously that curfew is probably going to be set uh, kind of mirroring what's been happening in other neighboring states. Ohio has a curfew where they never closed everything down completely, but they did put in that 10 p.m. curfew. And one of the reasons for that is trying to shut down that uh, the bar scene, basically, the people that are going in dancing and being close to one another and drinking a lot instead of just the restaurant scene. So it's expected that that's pretty much what's going to happen here uh, as well. And of course, a lot of the restaurant owners are saying, why not do that to begin with? But uh, that is going to be the, the case. So again, the governor expected to make that announcement uh, this afternoon. Typically her press conferences are what, around one or two o'clock. Tyler, I haven't seen an actual time come across. Uh, I've seen 12 noon. Typically they've been at the earliest around 1230 and at the latest around you know 2.30 or three o'clock. Today, uh, I, the, the time that I've seen is 12 noon. So what we will do is when we go off the air at 12 noon, at the end of the show, we'll just go straight into We'll, we'll make a transition, maybe 30 seconds to a minute or so of a transition straight into Governor Whitmer's press conference and just continue our coverage live on Civic Center TV and on Lakes FM uh, when we say goodbye to the BIF, to the Birmingham Area Municipal Access, and to the Chamber of Commerce at 12 noon. Uh, so with that, there is also a little bit more good news. Michigan is going to be getting some more vaccine after the feds decide to release the second doses. Trump administration will release additional COVID-19 vaccine doses to states across the nation as it directs its agencies to no longer hold back the second dose of the two shot vaccines and open vaccination to those 65 and over. Michigan opened vaccination to those over 65 this past Monday, but the federal government's release of the second doses expected to infuse the state with more vaccine availability with more than 2.5 million Michigan residents now eligible to receive COVID-19 vaccine. There isn't enough available to vaccinate everyone who qualifies. So this is some good news. Those second doses that were being held back are now going to be released. So more and more people can in fact get vaccinated. Yesterday, we had Dr. Faust here with us on the Megacast. He is the medical director for the Oakland County Health Department talking about the challenges the health department has had in trying to get enough vaccines. So we do invite you to go to civiccentertv.com to listen to that interview so that you understand the challenges that the health departments are facing, but this sounds like at least more vaccines are going to be on the way, which is good news. Yeah, good news, certainly. Uh, that's something that's been called for by the governor and, and by lo local count counties and municipalities that have been distributing these vaccines as the feds do have released additional doses. 2.5 million Michigan residents are now eligible for that. Hopefully we're able to get that process more under control and, and a little more efficient than it has been. Uh, now that we have those additional doses so that none of those doses or a very minimal amount of those doses, if any, go to waste and we can move this vaccination process further along and maybe get it back on track uh, after some hiccups, uh, which were to be expected at the beginning of a major logistical, logistical operation. Hey, uh, travelers flying into the United States from international destinations are going to be required to show proof of a neg negative COVID-19 test before boarding their flight. Uh, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention announced the new policy t uh, yesterday, said it's going to go into effect on January 26. The agency said it hopes the new testing requirement will help slow the spread of the virus currently surging in the U.S. as the vaccine rollout continues. CDC said travelers must get a viral test within three days before their flights to the U.S., which will likely send some vacationers scrambling to find locations during their trip. Passengers will have to show proof of a negative test to their airline before boarding. If a passenger does not provide documentation of a negative test or recovery from COVID-19, or chooses not to take a test, the airline must deny boarding, according to the CDC. That is the new mandate coming out yesterday. I can only imagine if you are traveling and you're overseas, this can become an issue of getting back into the United States. And by the way, it doesn't matter 
uh, your, uh, you know, your country of origin. You can be a United States citizen, but if you're overseas and you're trying to come back, you're going to need that COVID-19 test. Yeah, it's going to be some trouble for some of these international travelers coming back, whether they go over there for business or to visit some family or uh, for some uh, for some other legitimate reason. Getting back in the country is going to be a lot tougher because we're trying to keep COVID-19 cases out of here, especially with some of the with the uh, some of the variations that have popped up in places like the United Kingdom. And there's no required quarantine period when you come back into the country like you see in other nations like Canada that has a 14 day quarantine period for anybody re-entering uh, the, cu the country or going back into certain provinces. So proving that negative test is going to is the requirement, but it's going to be tougher for a lot of people, especially if they're in a country where they're not really familiar with the native language of that country and there's not a lot of English speaking in medical facilities potentially. You could have an issue of trying to get that test, let alone get the results and be able to show them as you're trying to board your plane and get back into the country. So we have a lot to get to on the Wednesday edition of the Oakland County Mega Cast. Again, we were supposed to have uh, Representative Andy Levin off the top of the show. He's been detained due to the vote uh, or the proceedings that's taking place right now at the U.S. House of Representatives trying to uh, impeach President Donald Trump for a second time. But if he is available even for a few minutes, he's going to pop into the show and we hope to be able to get him a little bit later. But also coming up on the show, did you set your New Year's resolutions? Have you already forgotten about them? We'll be speaking with uh, the Birmingham Maple Clinic coming up here on the Megacast. And then our good friend, Dr. Jamie Tawil will be with us in the 11 o'clock hour. A lot of questions for him. It's a new year. What about uh, your taxes? They're going to be coming soon as you uh, fill out uh, your end of the year. What does that mean for you? And are there any new laws that you should be aware of? We'll be talking to a CPA coming up in the 11 o'clock hour and also ending the show speaking with uh, one of the fun places to be able to go paint with a twist and uh, in Oakland County. It's uh, been a popular place. How are they surviving during the pandemic? So a lot to get to on the backside of the break. This is the Oakland County Megacast. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, Apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so, those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services.
we want to say thank you for taking a time out of your day to uh, tune in to the Oakland County Megacast. As a reminder, Tyler and I are here Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon. You can catch us on Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, Channel 15 if you have Comcast 99 on uh, AT&T. You can also tune us in to the radio if you're out driving around or if you still have one of the old school radios in your home, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, the BIF. And we also want to say thank you today to the West Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce for allowing us to live stream today's edition of the Megacast on their Facebook page. So we are uh, 13 days into the new year. Did you set a New Year's resolution? Have you already fallen off the wagon? (laughs) So many people do, but some manage to stick with those resolutions at least uh, maybe the first month, the second month. To talk with us a little bit more is going to be Carrie Craywick. She is with Birmingham Maple Clinic. Thank you so much for being with us. And again, our apologies for getting to you a little bit late in the show. Not at all. Thank you for having me. what is the point really of new year's resolutions because we all know we're going to break them yeah i think it's you know it's a normal time to do some goal setting you know it's a it's a kind of a rebirth a restart of the year and so people really look at it as an opportunity to sort of like renew or reinvent themselves and their goals the problem so often is that what they do is kind of throw a hail mary at the start of the year without really putting the thought into what are the changes they need to make how to sort of set themselves up for success it becomes too ambitious and that's why they implode uh, so i wonder to uh, this year was a little bit different right because we went through 2020 and everyone's looking at 2021 20, because uh, let's just be honest, 2020, anything is stuck. It, would, it didn't matter. Like routines were screwed up. Life was turned upside down. But here we are in 2021. And while the vaccine brought hope, we're still in the, ma- in the middle of the pandemic. So does that make it harder for people to stick with some of these resolutions? You know, I actually think it probably does, or maybe even makes them feel sort of hopeless about setting them to begin with. If you were planning for something big and then, you know, the possibility we were talking about like canceled travel or things like that, that would be such a disappointment. So people um, may actually find themselves more successful this year if they make their goals really COVID friendly and to do that, make them very small. So instead of thinking um, of a big ambitious goal to pick like maybe a daily behavior, one thing you'd like to apply to your normal routine, um, a small daily behavior is going to be much more successful for um, being able to maintain and even create some long-term lasting change than a big vague goal. I did see um, an interview with an individual uh, yesterday on one of the morning news shows. He lost like, uh, you know, 80 pounds during the pandemic, but he did say just that. I started with one tiny little goal. And then um, once I mastered that, then the next month I set another goal. And I added on to that goal because how long does it take for an individual to actually change their habits? You know, it really takes doing something, making something a part of your routine for, you know, three or more weeks. Um, And it also takes some flexibility. So I think people have a goal, you know, they want to do something and they think they should do it every single day. And then when they miss a day, they feel like it's a wash. So instead, really looking at a month and tracking a month and saying, hey, did I hit 75% of the days of this month? Um, that would be sort of a much more successful way to track your behavior. I think there's a real opportunity to use January also as what is it that I want and what are all the things that would need to happen to make me do it. So if it was get organized, get organized is so vague. But if you could say, you know, like, well, I'd have to clean my garage and I'd have to clean out my office, you know, use January to brainstorm all of the potential solutions and then do exactly like what he said. Pick one a month to tackle as opposed to trying to start with get organized at the start of the year, you'll, you'll be overwhelmed. So 2020 with the pandemic, we've all been living and changing everything that has happened. Uh, but with that, have the annual resolutions changed for the most part? Because it, it's typically lose weight, um, exercise more, you know, eat better food, those, you know, kind of the same things. Have they changed after we've gone through the pandemic? I think, I think they're mostly typically the same, you know, and one that you didn't mention, that's another common one is save more money. 
Um, so people trying to get, you know, financially healthy, physically healthy, um, the, uh, health and wellness are usually where, you know, um, resolutions sort of fall. I do think, like I said, the changes are maybe people are more aware of their behaviors. I had a client yesterday, you know, talking about her Amazon Prime purchases and just like how much and you just like, it's just so easy and it can just really get away with you. So, you know, like talking about being more mindful, more mindful about how and when you eat or what you eat. I think people are like maybe tuning in a little more, which may be a, a little blessing of this whole COVID time as there's a sort of a lot of opportunity to look in at yourself and what you're doing. Well, uh, and we have to say to Amazon, some of these companies make it so easy, especially Amazon, the one swipe, <laughs> you know, so you just jump and then boom, it's there. It's yeah. at your doorstep. So it does make it so much easier for shopping online. Uh, but w with that, if someone is off the wagon, uh -huh. how do they boost themselves back up to not feel defeated and continue down that negative path, but to, you know, put the light switch back on and redirect what they're doing to get back on that positive path. Absolutely. I think that people should maybe look at every two weeks as an opportunity to troubleshoot. Is there an opportunity? Was my goal too easy? Was I achieving it too easy? Or was I not challenged at all? Then maybe there's an opportunity to bump something up or add a little more. Did I have problems? So there's an opportunity to sort of brainstorm. Do I need an accountability partner? Would I be better off hiring someone to help me with this? You know, I think there's opportunities every two weeks to sort of reevaluate. How did I do? What were my highs? What were my lows? What do I need help with? And then in the spirit of COVID, that's where you pivot and then shift the goal there. So it's that instead of one singular goal for the whole year, it's a small chunk that you're sort of evaluating yourself over and over and over. Carrie Craywick with us. She's with the Birmingham Maple Clinic. And with that, we now have um, so many different apps on our phone. Mm -hmm. Are there some good apps or some good ways to kind of track your progress or your pitfalls as well? Yeah, I think that, I mean, even like, of course, there are so many for when it comes to you know, spending or exercise or things like that. So whatever, whatever you choose, you could certainly find an app for it. I think tracking is tracking is very um, linked to success. So if there's a behavior you want to change in yourself, even making a note, either physically on a calendar or putting a note in a calendar on your phone or finding an app to do that, looking at yourself every single day. And then, like I said, taking, taking a pause every two weeks to look back and say, yeah, what days did I hit? What days did I not? Do I need to reevaluate what I do on the weekends or, you know, the start of my week? It'll give you, it'll give you some clues as to how to move forward. So I've noticed too, um, I do like my uh, Apple watch, like the new updated one, because if you start walking or exercising, it will remind you, Hey, it looks like you might be uh, exercising. Do you want me to start? Uh, it, which is good because for me, sometimes I'm the type of person I'll add things on my to-do list that I've already done just so I can see that check mark. Yeah, I love it. You're, you had asked me about my resolutions and it, it reminded me of one. I downloaded an app for doing planks. So do a couple minutes of planks a day and um, that I can slip in anywhere. But it'll remind me, too, you didn't do yours today. So um, and there's really no excuse not to like something like that is like a two minute goal. It really doesn't change my routine any more than brushing my teeth. And I have no excuse not to sneak it into my day. Yeah, but are you going to, you know, get down on the on the ground in the middle of Target to do your plank? <laughs> <laughs> no, probably not. But right now, you know, I'm pretty much, you know, in, in the comfort of my home most of my day. So this is a, if we don't start in January, is it OK to start other times? Because we also hear where people, uh, oh, I'm going to start a diet, but I'm going to start Mondays. Yeah. You know, what is that about our mindset? that we need certain times or certain days or certain months to be able to start some of these new habits. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's really arbitrary. It's it's probably it's it's it is just like you said, it's probably just a, a weird habit of our mind that it feels better to have a like a start day. So we start often people like I said start at the new year. This year it was the fourth because of the way the weekend fell. So people were starting on Monday and not on the first. Sometimes people start in September as like the sort of school year 
as a start. So I think yeah, we have these sort of like arbitrary beginnings, but there's really no need for it to be whatever your start day could be your start day. And, and like I said, I think that if, even if you have a month that doesn't seem to look well, use that month as an opportunity to, to, to revisit. I think like people who didn't start in January or have fallen short already can use the rest of this month to say, okay, what are all of my goals? What does it take to accomplish them? And then even, you know, I, there are some ideas too, we're using a month, not just for, you know, uh, if one, if, if one is weight loss and another is financial health and another is organization, you can break your year down that way. You know, and there's some months that lend themselves to things more than others. So we've all seen the commercial on Facebook where it talks about groups, uh, you know, dog walking groups or this group or this group or that group. How important is it for people to seek support in some of these outside groups and with people that they don't even know? so important because I think, like you said, there's so much um, experience of failure and shame when someone starts something and doesn't go well, or some of the vague goals like lose weight, you may be doing everything right and not lose weight. And that can be so upsetting. And when you're able to sort of share those stresses with other people and get reassurance and feedback that, you know, you're on the right track, um, that can really elevate, elevate your motivation. Um, you know, even just being there for someone else is stress relieving for the giver and the receiver. So, you know, both parties actually benefit from having um, connection to other people. And like I said, it can reduce the experience of shame. And actually, and actually, um, we're seeing so much, you talked about apps, in terms of these like social apps that are, have a competitive nature, like Peloton and stuff. I mean, people are really getting involved because they have a sense that they wanna show up and, you know, be a part of something and compete a little. It, it, but with that, um, I, I did see the story with the guy who lost so much weight. And one of the things he did is he was actually posting videos from the very beginning, I think on TikTok and, um, and, and you know, the before and the after in a year. So is there kind of that motivation uh, when you go public, which can be embarrassing for people to have the courage to go public, but when they go public and people start following them, mm -hmm. Is that um, the motivation to keep going? And what about the people who, who fail? Because we see the end results of the ones that succeed. Right, for sure. I think that for the ones that succeed, I'm sure that creates like a safety net for them that they become, that puts a little extra pressure on them to not fail or to not give up because they maybe know they have some people watching them and holding them accountable. Um, like you said, for some, that pressure can be crushing. Um, it could be humiliating. And so I think you'd have to sort of know yourself, know your personality, also know your followers um, to have maybe a good gauge of if that's the right strategy for you. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, because we've seen th people, we all follow these groups and you think it's motivation, but sometimes too, it's kind of like, forget it, <laughs> you know, because we see the end result. So it's good to see them going through the process, but the process takes a long time. And that's where we have to have a little bit of grace with ourselves. Sure, absolutely. I think when you see those two, and this is where it goes with all the tiny, tiny little behaviors is that you can see a picture, say, wow, so and so looks fabulous, but maybe not also account what were the sacrifices that had to happen, you know, what things had to be given up, how did it, you know, maybe inconvenience her routine or her family or whatever it is. And then you have to, then you evaluate, am I willing to sort of invest that for that result and do that cost benefit analysis with yourself and be honest with yourself. If you're not willing to give something up, then that result isn't going to be for you and thus shouldn't probably be your goal. With us here on the Mega Cast is Carrie Craywick. She's with the Birmingham Maple Clinic. And, and, and with that, uh, just a couple more minutes with you before we let you go. New Year with hope. Um, so many people are continuing to struggle with the mental health aspect of the year that we just lived and it's not over yet. How does that play into our resolutions and improving our lives as well? So important. So in general, um, there's research that really says that people who are depressed are more likely to set vague, unreachable goals. And the setting of vague and unreachable goals actually makes people more depressed. So that's a really vicious cycle. So any effort to make a very, like we said, a very small daily goal is going to improve your likelihood of its success, but it's also going to really contribute to your mood and be a sign of a healthy 
mood as it is. So, um, yes, yeah, certainly, certainly we've seen a year with a lot of depression, anxiety, substance overuse, you know, all kinds of things that, um, relate to mental health. So, you know, I think if people do have sort of an awareness that maybe their moods or emotions are not where they want to be, it would be a great year to set some goals about your mental wellness too. So Carrie, with that, do you have any advice for individuals that are witnessing maybe a loved one or a friend that is in this spiral of depression to try to help them? I don't want to say snap out of it because it, it is a process, but to help them shift their attitude and their mood back to something more positive? Sure. I mean, I think in some ways it's always important to be bold and ask point blank, if you have any worry that someone's at risk of hurting or harming themselves or not, you know, not healthy or well to ask them point blank. Um, and, if, and if they do say yes, you know, I'm very depressed or sometimes I even think about, you know, my death or things like that um, to really be available to them in a way to say, hey, look, you know, there are ways we can get help if, if they're really at high risk to certainly call 911 or take them to a hospital. But it's a perfect time to start therapy, especially for people who historically haven't wanted to because um, the ability to do it via Zoom and telehealth really makes it sort of a low effort, you know, low shame. You can do it from the privacy of your home. You don't even have to put on clothes. You can wear your sweatpants and, you know, like it's, it can be, it's a very low effort version of therapy that would really serve people who have historically avoided it. And do you think because of the pandemic and the crisis that we've been through over the past 10 months, the issue of mental health and in, in seeking therapy is becoming more acceptable because there was a stigma that was attached to it before? Yes, yeah, sir. I mean, I think people certainly recognize that there are. Um that people were having a lot of mental health experiences over the last months. I mean, anxiety and anger and um, depression and, you know, loss. And so I think people's emotions were more to the surface, which made it maybe also, like you said, it was, it was shared more, at least in social media or even amongst, you know, celebrities or public figures to say, um, this is hard. There are feelings associated with how hard it is and there is ways to get help and to treat it. I think perhaps also we, we've spent a lot of our lives very distracted, whether it's, you know, with our phones and our apps or, you know, out in the world or buying, you know, think whatever it is. And, you know, to, to be kind of at home and, and really reflecting on how do I feel um, has given people the opportunity to sort of clean the slate and, and really take a look at what, how they really do want their lives to look. So what are the signs, like when should an individual or a loved one push for someone to seek professional help? Are there certain signs to look for? Or, you know, when do we just know that this is just a funk that you're in? Right. So I think, you know, as as, uh, clinicians, we always think of intensity, frequency, and duration, meaning how long has it lasted? How intense or deep are the feelings? Um, And... um, And yeah, like, and how long has it been over time? So, right, certainly like low mood or, you know, more anxiety that's, that's sort of been in line with the situation, right? And if it's situational, like if, if something changed, would that go away? then maybe it's fine. But if it persists, then that's when you would really say you need to get therapy. Now, I think it's hard because sometimes we're not, you know, we're not together in person. You don't see like, you know, any significant changes in weight, significant changes in hygiene and taking care of yourself. You know, one thing we look for is avoidance of activities, which now, I mean, we're, we're purposefully avoiding activities, but if you're, you know, trying to draw someone out in an opportunity and they're canceling a lot or um, just our, our zero sense of availability to do something even even socially, even if it's via Zoom, then maybe that's a sign that they're kind of pulling away and need to be checked in on. Yeah, sometimes it's, you know, just taking a simple walk mm-hmm. outside can, um, you know, reevaluate your mood and, and snap you out of some of these depressive moments that you're in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's another another kind of secret blessing of COVID was people really reconnected with nature. And there's so much research that says getting outdoors, spending time in parks and outside um, is, is fabulous for your mood from a biological place, but also for your thoughts and feelings. I will say there have been days where it's like you're binging Netflix, <laughs> especially when you go into the winter time, right? And it's snowing and it's cold outside. You're still in your pajamas. You're binging Netflix. But when you have a dog and they're like 
barking at you and pawing at you, you have to get up and go outside. So uh, I will say pets can be a savior in, in some of these times as well. For sure. I have a toddler, so it's kind of the same thing, but <laughs> yes, we're, we're, and that was how we coped with um, March last year when school from home was like, whatever we could do to get our worksheets done so we could get outside. Wow. Yeah. I'm struggling with a dog. I couldn't imagine having a toddler. So um, anything else um, before we let you go that you want to maybe mention that we didn't touch on here today? Um, you know, actually, no, I think that this was a really great talk. I think, like I said, is there's always, there is always hope to try something new and it, all, it can just be one little step. One little step a day is all you need. Um, and, and that motivation, it's like the journey of, uh, you know, a thousand miles starts with a few steps. So just think one step a day is enough. That's great advice. And with that, Carrie, quickly before we let you go, you're with the Birmingham Maple Clinic. Uh, if people were watching or listening to this interview, how can they get in contact with your staff? Oh, thank you so much. Well, we have a website, birminghammaple.com. So they could visit us on our website. Um, they could also um, call our office. We do have office in staff and that number is 248-646-6659. Well, it's been great talking to you and we so appreciate your time. And again, our apologies for coming to you a little bit uh, late as well. Uh, so uh, Carrie uh, Craywick with us from Birmingham Maple Clinic. It's not too late. If you fell off the wagon for your resolutions, jump back on the wagon today. Carrie, thank you for being with us. Yeah. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. Still a lot to get to uh, as the show continues after this break. The only way to beat COVID-19 is to face it. You can't get too comfortable. You can't forget the danger. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wash your hands. Keep a safe distance. Especially in the next few months. You know we'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. Someday. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But not yet. But not yet. Consider virtual gatherings for the holidays. Curbside food order. Grocery delivery. And shopping local. Shop local. And especially shopping local. Let's beat this virus. We can if we face it together. 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 For the latest information, visit oakgov.com forward slash COVID. Perry tested positive for COVID-19. Emma was exposed to a friend who's positive. Willa's waiting on test results. After any contact with COVID-19, or if you test positive, stay home for at least 10 days. If you live with others, keep your distance and wear a mask. Help Michigan contain COVID-19. Visit michigan.gov slash contain COVID. Receive our vaccine, we want to say thank you um, for taking time out Pfizer. of your day to be with us here on the Mega Cast. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in my home studios, Mr. Tyler Keith, holding things down back in West Bloomfield. As a reminder, uh, you catch us Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. until noon on Civic Center TV. You can also tune us in Birmingham Area Municipal Access. If you have cable, channel 15 on Comcast, 99 on AT&T. You can also listen to us on the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, The BIP. We also want to extend our gratitude to the West Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce for allowing us to live stream today's edition of the Megacast on their Facebook page. And each and every day we are utilizing all of our available avenues, which is TV, radio, and social media to bring you the information because 10 months into this pandemic, the information is changing each and every day. Of course, 2021 brought with it the hope of the vaccine, but getting the vaccine rolled out has come 
with a few hiccups. We were uh, lucky enough yesterday to speak with the medical director for the Oakland County Health Department about the vaccine and some of the challenges that they are experiencing and trying to get enough of the vaccine right now. We receive our vaccine um, direct from Pfizer and, and that distribution is regulated by CDC which Tyler, basically we, dictates uh, down to, to the states that, what their allocation um, is. The and then MDHHS, Michigan Department yesterday? of Health and Human Services, dictates where, how that's distributed across the counties in the state. <clears throat> um, we've been receiving so just sure under 2,000 exactly doses per week. Exactly, we were going to be which, able to uh, play yeah, is a little, the clip a little from frustrating. Dr. Faust, uh, we have, we have playing the clip. We have redeployed the, our staff oh, we allocated we are playing our resources you can't hear it because i have to, to um oh okay here you go our Play capacity up, our vaccinating capacity to about twenty thousand per week and yet we get only two thousand per week we get one thousand nine hundred fifty doses per week so um you know it, it, there's nobody to blame really understand pfizer's making the stuff as fast as they possibly can. They're supplying the entire planet with vaccine, just as Moderna is. And, um, you know, MDHHS gets a limited supply every week, somewhere between 60 and 100,000 doses for the entire state. So, you know, that the fact is, the entire world will be frustrated for a while. Everybody would like to have vaccine right now. And, um, and that's just not possible. So CDC and MDHHS have um, essentially provided guidelines for how to prioritize who does get, who does receive vaccine. Um, you know, state announced this week, I don't even know honestly what day it is, but they announced that um, those who are 75 and older um, can receive vaccine 65 and older with chronic health conditions. You know, we have 217,000 residents in Oakland County alone, 65 and older. Even if we just talk about the 1A priority group, we're talking about tens of thousands of people. And we have received, you know, fewer than 2,000 doses per week. As of yesterday afternoon, we have vaccinated 4,669 people. Um, so basically every dose we receive, we stick in in somebody's arm. <clears throat> and um, so far that has been primarily EMS, healthcare workers, teachers, and police, sheriffs. Um, and again, we've scheduled every dose that we receive. And right now, because we're trying to anticipate, we're scheduling, you know, people for appointments where we haven't received doses yet. So we we have to um, we have to rely on the state to send us to continue sending us vaccine. That was Dr. Russell Faust on yesterday's edition of the Oakland County MegaCast. You can see his entire interview on our website on CivicCenterTV.com. Talking about the process of distributing those vaccines out to the general public of course the centers for disease control controls that they distribute that those vaccines to the states and the states to various departments and, and counties and the county will then have its own operation in distributing that vaccine that's those were those stages 1a 1b that he was talking about let's bring ronnie back in we also have dr to with us online on zoom it really is interesting uh the behind the scenes situation that goes on to try to not only get the vaccine manufactured, but distributed and then down to the individual agencies that need to go ahead and be able to uh, get it in the arms of the individuals that need it. With us right now is Dr. Jamie Tawil. He's the internal medicine specialist for the Grand River Medical Associates. Always great to have you with us, Doc. How are you? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. How are you? 
Uh, you know what? We're, we're surviving. Like every day is a new day. So a few technical glitches there because I'm working from home. So there are a few issues like that we always have to iron out. Um, um, so if you hear a dog barking, forgive me. <laughs> right, and like we're all used to it now. Zoom and technical issues before you would freak out. Now it's just like, yeah, that's what happens. <laughs> that's how my that's how my Christmas was. It was uh, the, my Christmas and Thanksgiving were Zoomed. So that's the, you do the best you can. Exactly. With that, though, uh, good doc, uh, have you been able to get the vaccine yet? I did, actually. I, I got the first shot right before Christmas, and then I got the second dose about uh, two days ago. So it was like three weeks out. So I, I finally I finally got vaccinated through my hospital that I'm affiliated with, and they were able to get me taken care of. Thank God. So we have heard from uh, several individuals that have had it. The first shot, they really had no side effects. It was the second one where they had a few issues such as headache or maybe fatigue. What did you experience? So the first shot I felt, I felt, uh, you know, muscle aches, headaches, a little foggy. Uh, that went away rather quickly, but it lasted for about a good 48 hours. Uh, beyond that, um, the second shot, I was pretty tired it, it, and my arm was definitely sore. But I was tired for a day and then uh, I feel great. I, I got the shot Monday. Today's what, Wednesday? So yesterday I felt eh, not so bad. Monday I felt pretty under the weather, but nothing by any means major. It was, you know, I was still able to go to work, still able to do everything. But uh, it was, you know, thankfully not a, not a bad reaction. The good majority of the reactions that you would have happened with roughly within six weeks of getting the vaccine. So if you're going to have any major reactions, they will happen within six weeks. So it's a good thing because when they were studying this vaccine, they gave a full eight weeks of evaluation before they were able to, you know, it's either going to happen rather immediately or within the six weeks. So the good thing that they did eight weeks and they still were able to suggest that, uh, you know, a good hunk of the people that received the vaccine in early testing were able to tolerate it quite well. So as a doctor, how did you think this helps you to be able to talk about the vaccine with some of your patients? Because a lot of people are out there are real still in the in, in the part of eh, not me, not yet. I can understand that. I, 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 I can understand that. I am always going to recommend that you receive the vaccine. It's going to help create that herd immunity that everybody's talking about. The vaccine is is going to help keep you from getting ill. Um, it will, you know, don't make make no mistake the vaccine is not going to make you immune and there hasn't been a lot of studies out yet that suggest that just because you've received the vaccine you're not going to get sick at all you may just get a milder case of it and you can still transmit it to other people so as always i'm going to recommend you continue to use the precautions to not have you know wear the masks maintain social distancing until this gets under you know more widespread vaccinations versus you know uh, uh we get to that herd immunity point that everybody keeps uh, trying to get to. You're listening to 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake, 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills. And you bring up a good point there because we are all talking about herd immunity and do you get the vaccine? Do you not get the vaccine? And so many people that are getting the vaccine are saying, I'm not necessarily doing it for myself. I'm doing it for other people. But at the end of the day, just like testing was such a big issue, there are a lot of unanswered questions about the vaccine as well. And unlike, you know, taking a mask on, taking a mask off for the testing, this is something that's going in your body that you can't remove. Yeah. So you can kind of understand where people are uneasy uh, about getting the vaccine. I do understand and, and the quickness in which it was rolled out. Um, I can assure you that it's safe. Uh, I mean, I can't guarantee that you won't have a reaction to it. And I, I you know, I'm not claiming that it's going to be 100% safe. But at the same time, it, it should be as safe as any other vaccine. It's essentially the same thing as any other vaccine you would receive, minus, I, feel, I believe, actually a few preservatives. I think the, the issue that held out a lot of the vaccine rollout was to be able to do preservatives, which is why I think the vaccine requires such a, you know, that below 70 degrees freezing temperature. Um, I, I understand people's concerns and reservations. I, I, I always recommend it to my patients and I always will. Uh, I'm not going to harp on them. I'm not going to harass them. You, you know, people are capable of making their own decisions, but you are getting the vaccine for other people as well as yourself, because once everybody gets vaccinated, then we can move forward and not have to worry about everybody getting ill or people that are not vaccinated. We're not, you know, you know, creating widespread 
you know, people that have become inoculated and are, uh, you know, they're a little bit safer, but at the same time, they're not contributing to this humongous spread. Uh, you know, it, it's ultimately going to lead to, to overall safety. One of the things I find fascinating, though, is the thought process, beside, you know, behind herd immunity. So I was mentioning with Dr. Faust yesterday, I had recently watched a documentary about the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone. And how do we get to that point where you can reopen schools, you can reopen businesses and continue to live life as you used to know it? What is that process and why does it just go away? Because if one person gets it, why doesn't it continue the spread? Well, it, it, that's a little tough because right now we're actually dealing with it as we're dealing with it, if, if that makes any sense. You know, most of the time we're able to have, uh, we look at things more from a retrospective point of view, but this time as we're dealing with it, you know, like for example, take the flu shots. We are aware of how that will work, you know, how the vaccines will impact society with regards to flu shots. You know, herd immunity will occur, I imagine, if everybody gets the vaccine and it can, you know, we can prevent a lot of spread. In this case, it's, ha you know, you're either getting sick or getting the vaccine. So it's going to change things just a little bit as we're moving along. The, you know, how do we get there? I think we get there by everybody getting, uh, hopefully I'm answering your question. Uh, we get there by everybody getting the vaccine so that the spread is not as dangerous and we're not overwhelming hospitals. We're not overwhelming the healthcare system, which has been a problem that we've been dealing with for almost a year now. So that really is the focus is trying to keep, uh, because we still get the flu. There's a vaccine for the flu. We still get the flu and we have to remember there are people that do die from the flu every year. Uh, we just don't talk about it. Uh, like probably what really needs to be talked about, but I will say the good thing that's come out of this the number of flu cases are actually down. You called it earlier this year. You're like, yeah, we're anticipating there's going to be fewer flu cases because we are being um, more aware of the virus. And, you know, when you wash your hands and you keep your social distance, that means other viruses aren't going to attack us as well. I do. I do. I think that we're going to, people are starting to realize that these measures will help them through a lot of illnesses and, and they're not wrong to wear the mask and social distance. Um, I can also I can also suggest I don't know how real this is, but you know, just using my own office as a personal anecdote, people do come to me with flu-like symptoms, and they don't want to know if they have the flu. They want to know if they have COVID. We <laughs> test them; it's negative, and then they go about their business. They go, "Okay, I don't have COVID," and then they go, not knowing they may actually have the flu, and they didn't return for testing for the flu. So, I, you know, that may lead to a dip in diagnosis as well. We're not <laughs> testing for the flu as often. But uh, you know, obviously, everyone's more concerned about COVID. Uh, and if you remember, if you do get the vaccine, it should. It's you know, they aim for fifty percent protection against things, specifically with with vaccines. In this case, it's up to ninety five percent. So it will help you to prevent getting very sick from it. It may not prevent you from getting sick, but it may prevent a more severe, serious reaction because your your body has been basically sensitized to COVID, the COVID uh, the COVID virus. So really, it's a thought process that's the same behind the flu shot. It doesn't mean you're not going to get the flu. You're just not going to get as bad of a case Absolutely. that you would get without it. Uh, with that, uh, so your office, like individual offices, you're not actually given the vaccine, though, are you? No, uh, I, I'm not. Not for a few reasons. Number one, I'm still under un, un, unsure how to get it. <laughs> um, I, you know, I got mine through the hospital and I advise people to go to Michigan.gov to see where they're going to fall in terms of being able to receive the vaccine. You know, schools, health departments, things like that. They are going to get the vaccine through their employers. That's how they're going to contract through it. Um, I imagine it'll be a bigger rollout through pharmacies because that's going to be a little bit more global as opposed to individual offices. Not only that, I, I lack the capabilities right now to keep the vaccine at the temperature required. So, uh, you know, I don't know how many vaccines I'd be able to get and I have to be able to give them and maintain enough to be able to give them the second dose. So if I get 100 vaccines and I give 100 vaccines and then I don't get any later on, then I'm in a world of hurt because I have patients that have received the first dose that haven't received the second and you need both doses in order for it to be completely effective. Right. I, you know, the sad thing today, um, we are hearing some of the cases too, where some of the hospitals and these entities, they have so many of the doses and people don't want to get them, but 
they've already taken them out of the freezer. And once they're unfrozen, you can't refreeze them. So they're having to either throw them away because there was an issue of them saying, hey, we don't want to waste them. Let's just find people to give the vaccine to. But there are strict mandates as to who can actually receive those uh, vaccines as well. Yeah, it's a big work in progress. And we are stumbling along the way, obviously. And I imagine, though, in a couple more months, uh, I know I know that Johnson & Johnson is working on a vaccine that doesn't require refrigeration and is only one shot. Um, that may have more preservatives to it. I don't know. I, I, I can't speak on that. But I imagine when that comes out, that'll be a little bit more widespread and a little bit easier to administer. Currently, I think that uh, big companies like pharmacies are going or, or, you know, larger health groups that are multiple offices are going to be able to have the capabilities to store the vaccine and have a, an ability to, you know, uh, monitor how they're giving it out to a degree where they can make sure that they're not wasting vaccines and that they're giving them to patients that require it and that they're able to get the second dose. Uh, I'm happy to wait to the end of the line. <laughs> <laughs> so be that the is... last person to be on some on new medication. So. <laughs> right. And, and I am glad that uh, because I am hearing that uh, mainstream media is possibly going to be added to uh, the list of, you know, basically some of the people on the front lines to be able to start to get it, it maybe uh, if not this month, maybe next month. Um, but being public access, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm happy not to be mainstream any longer. I'll wait until March or April. I'm good. I think in time, people will realize that those that have received the vaccine will be okay. Uh, and it'll probably lead to a little bit more of a relaxed atmosphere where people will feel better about getting the vaccine. I think people I think people are smart and I think people are are um, smart, I guess I, I wouldn't use any other word. People are smart. They, they know that it's going to help them in the long run. I think people are anxious to get back to their normal way of life. And I know that I feel that people are are aware that this is the way to do it. I think people are cautious and they are rightfully so. Honestly, I, I understand that. Um, I do, I, again, recommend it. But if people want to wait a little bit, I can understand that as well. And, I think just time is going to be able to tell. Uh, one of the big questions, but we're still in the midst of this pandemic, we're still having issues about the testing. Nowhere, uh, nowhere near the issues that we had in the beginning, and it is starting to flatten. However, there are still issues about the accuracy of the test. And also, I think it's more important too, people are like, did I already have this? And so they're seeking the antibody test. Mm -hmm. What are you telling your patients who want to get the antibody test? And is there one that's better than the other? Or should you just forego it and wait to get the vaccine? I, you know, the vaccine, so I have a lot of people that want to get the vaccine, uh, correction, sorry, the antibody test. I have a lot of patients that want to get the antibody test to see if they've been exposed to it. Um, I think that whether or not they've, they have a positive antibody, they should still get the vaccine. They should be still, you know, because there are people that there, there have been cases of people that have received that have gotten COVID have gotten it again. And I have had patients that have had a positive, then end up with a negative, believe it or not. So this this can happen. Um, I know I have patients that I can save, you know, I can think of a few off the top of my head that tested positive for the respiratory. Later on down the road, we tested for the antibody and it was negative. So the antibody will tell you that you've been exposed to it. It won't tell you whether or not you are actively ill or, or have been actively ill. It'll just tell exposure. The people that have not felt a thing ask me if they've received the, the antibody, you know, that have said, you know, my spouse had they had COVID. I didn't feel a thing. I felt great. We test them. They're positive. So it's, it's hard to tell what to do in these scenarios. Um, you know, it, it just, it only shows exposure. I think the antibody test is a good idea, but at the same time, I, I the question is, why order a test if it's not going to change what you do? Um, I'm still going to recommend you get the vaccine. I'm still going to recommend that you maintain precautions. You know, people that have that have been exposed to COVID are not out of the woods. So, you know, I question the merit of the vaccine, the, the antibody test. However, that's all we had at one point in time. So that's what everybody was going with. And now that we have better ways to do it, we have more, uh, you know, we have, Rapid tests, not 100% accurate, but are are able to give us a clear idea of where we are. And we also have more accurate nasal swabs that are going to give us a clear idea of whether or not people are actively ill. So my question with the antibody testing, it just, we went through this with my own family. 
um, my mother had passed away in October and, you know, through the funeral and the process, several family members ended up getting COVID. Uh, we believe it's, it, it was from attending the funeral, but then like when we went to get together for Christmas, it was like, well, six of the eight people are already knowingly had COVID. So if get the antibody test to see if maybe you had it and you didn't know you have it. So then you can get together safely because the whole group's had it. So we're okay to get together. Is there any merit to that thought process? I understand how that thought process might be beneficial, but again, there have been people who have had COVID who have managed to get it again. There have been documented cases of that. So I don't necessarily know if that's going to be the safest route to take. I would recommend against it. I understand that logic and how, you know, people that have been together and have done okay. And, and, and that's understandable. Um, but, you know, I'm always going to err on the side of caution. I'm always going to try and do whatever I can to prevent people from getting ill. And so my recommendation, as unfortunate as it is, is to be to be aware, even if you have a positive antibody test, um, that doesn't mean you are immune and Superman and able to go do these things. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you can't give it to other people. So it, it's it's something you have to be you have to be concerned about. I will say, I think about these times. I'm like, oh my god, I am so glad I am married because I could not imagine trying to be a single person and date during these times. I mean, what do you do? You just put your your love life on hold for a, a year, I guess. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> their love life, their career, their families. It's just been it's been a mess, <laughs> you know. And I don't. I think everybody is just, and it's weird to get back to normal, I think, because we've been doing this for quite a while now, you know, and I, I, uh, I was in one of my patient rooms the other day with my mask off with, you know, by myself. And I, I was talking to someone outside of the room and I actually heard my voice echoing off the walls, which is something I don't normally hear because I have the mask that basically muffles that. So it was, it's, it's odd. It's just surreal how normal this has all become, but it will return to the previous normal. <laughs> it's just going to take some time. I, I will say I'll never get used to wearing a mask yeah. ever. I, I'm that individual that you see when I get out of my car. I'm like, I wait until the very last moment to put my mask on to walk into the store. If I'm walking through the parking lot, free air, you know, so I'm that person. <laughs> and then I realized I forgot my mask. I have to go all the way back to the car. So it's, it's, uh, yeah, man, it's, it's a mess. But. We do see them all the time too, right? <laughs> I was uh, t laughing at my husband. Uh, he does sports for Fox 2 and he was able to go, I don't know, I think the Red Wings or one of those entities. And he did his stand up with his mask on. And I was like, no one's around you. You can have the photographer six feet away. I go, you sound like the Peanuts um, cartoons, like the teacher. <laughs> I'm like, I can't understand a word you're saying. So he's talking through the mask onto the microphone. Yes. Oh, poor guy. I, I, at least they can't see his face when they discuss the lions. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's very true, right? <laughs> Dr. Jamie Tuiel, always great having you with us uh, here. Uh, any other things that you're seeing um, it, it is hopefully we come into the end of this pandemic? Um, I'm not I'm not seeing anything majorly different other than what we've been seeing. You know, the vaccine has been out and they're getting shots in arms, thank the Lord. But at the same time, not nearly where we needed to be. I mean, I had just received my second dose. It's been out for a bit now. So I have patients that have been asking me day in and day out, like, when am I going to be able to get it? How do I get it? Can you write me a letter that suggests that I, you know, may need it a little bit earlier? And, you know, we're happy to oblige in those situations when they are merited. But I think the the thing is, is to everybody should just be patient and continue to go to michigan.gov. That has the ultimate list of, you know, it has the, well, the, the vaccine dashboard, but that has a clear idea of who has how much vaccine, where you're able to get it, when you're able to get it. And I, again, will always recommend that you do get it. It will help move things along. I, I can guarantee that. Um, I, I don't feel that the, I haven't heard of any cases yet where there've been severe reactions, thank God. And I hope not to hear any. Um, I think that we're, we're on our way. And I, I tell patients, you know, if you're afraid of the vaccine, I get it, but you know, what are we more afraid of, COVID or the vaccine? So, uh, it, it you know people are starting to realize that it, it is important. So I'm I'm glad to see that people are going in the right direction, and just keep it up, guys. We're in the home stretch. It's you know we're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. I promise. I, I know that in the beginning of this, we had a lot of people that had underlying health issues that weren't going to the hospital. Is yeah. that still a case, or is that pretty much 
those fears have been put to rest because the hospitals have proven that they can handle emergencies and COVID patients at the same time. I think that fear is still there, um, it, unfortunately, but it, and it's going to take a little bit of time. It is better, much, much better. I have patients that are, it used to be a struggle to get a patient to go to the ER. They'd call the office and say, you know, I'm having chest pain and difficulty breathing. I don't want to go to the ER. And, you know, there are some things that the hospitals can provide that I can't do at least and specifically not have results as quickly as I would be able to in the office. So, you know, it was a struggle to get people to go to the ER. I'm seeing a relax of that fear. Some of it is still there. So I think people that have minor issues are more apt to go to urgent care, things like that. Um, but it is getting better. And and I'm, I'm starting to see things go back to normal. Thank, thank God. Fingers crossed. We're into 2021. Uh, let's hope that at least by what, March, April, May? <laughs> The summertime, at least. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a while. I think the summer will be um, slow, a slow roll back into society. But I think it will. This will be uh, the end of the summer will probably be where everybody will start really feeling that sigh of relief. I'm hoping. Oh, we are also hoping. And thank you, uh, Dr. Jamie Tweel with us here on the Megacast, always being a good friend to us, but also thank you for all of your advice as well, because it's such a confusing time for us in the general public. And I know for yourself as well in the medical community, but at least being able to talk to someone with your knowledge and your expertise can put some of those questions to rest. So we always appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm always available and I love talking to you guys. So I, I appreciate it very much and I look forward to hopefully speaking to you guys again. Thank you so much. Happy 2021, Dr. Jamie Tawil, internal medicine specialist over at the Grand River Medical Associates. We're gonna take a quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast. Still a lot to get to for the remainder of the hour. This is the Megacast. COVID-19 has caused many families to fall behind on finances and on groceries, but you're not Getting, alone. Uh, you shouldn't have to worry about putting food on the table. MyBridges offers access to quality food and income assistance to help families across the state get the food support they need. It's easy to apply and easy to start shopping. Apply for services at michigan.gov slash MIBridges. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19 to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. We want to say thank you for taking time out of your Wednesday to join us on the Oakland County Megacast. We were hoping to have U.S. Representative Andy Levin with us here on the Megacast. He had to step out due to the hearings that are underway right now in D.C. starting the uh, impeachment proceedings against the president. If we're able to get him even for just a few minutes, we'll be happy to do so. But in the meantime, We'll continue the conversation here on the Megacast, and this is tax season, and it's been a year like no other. And with us right now, Adam Schultz, he's a CPA and director for Cohen and Company. Great to have you with us here on the Megacast. Great to be here. Thank you, Ronnie. Uh, so many questions coming out of the pandemic, but off the top of your head, what is going to be the biggest issue for people filing their taxes in the new year? Uh, it's, it's hard to pin it down, obviously. Uh, there are so many. I mean, I, I think the main thing we're going to hit on today is the PPP loan. Uh, the biggest question that everyone had, which was just resolved in December, was are those expenses that are covered under PPP, are those going to be deductible? And thankfully, the IRS came out and said that, yes, they are going to be. So 
I think that's the clarity everybody was looking for and was unsure as they were looking to apply for forgiveness. Thankfully, that's been out there. So that's one we can check off the box and move forward after that. I will say, how do you keep up with these changes? Because the tax code changes on such a regular basis. You really need someone who is an expert such as yourself to help navigate this crazy world. It is hard to navigate. So we've got a, a few hundred people in our tax department and I, I will, I'll give, you know, I, I, I do a lot more on the audit side than tax and I will give those folks credit. They are on top of things. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give a plug later for a webinar that we're doing tomorrow, which is all about the new PPP loan and all the relevant um, implications to the tax code. Uh, it, it's a, it's an around the clock job, especially in the last couple of years, you know, with the, the tax cuts and jobs act and then everything that's come since, since then it, it's hard to keep up. Yeah, because on top of that, we had a change in the administration, which then brought a change in the tax laws and the tax code. But then now we're adding all these issues with the pandemic. And I think for the general person, if they were on unemployment or even a regular person that may have received the stimulus check, how does that impact their taxes? So uh, you're right. It's been very complicated. So the a pretty substantial change in the tax code, biggest that we've seen in a couple of decades happened at the beginning of the Trump administration. And we don't know what's going to happen now. Obviously, there's a, a change in power coming. Um, you know, the, the rules that are unemployment and the stimulus checks are, are largely unchanged. Um, so it's, it's still reportable income. Again, I'll defer to our, our detailed tax folks. And I know they're um, they're putting on something for the general public tomorrow um, in terms of how some of those items are treated. It's done a lot more money in the system in terms of unemployment, in terms of stimulus. Uh, thankfully, a lot of the treatment hasn't changed on those two items. Yeah, but at the end of the day, people need to pay taxes on those, right? They, yeah, they do. They still do, correct. <laughs> Which I, for some people are going to be like, hey, wait a minute. Uh, but uh, it's not necessarily just, you know, that free check. You have to pay taxes because even though the money came from Uncle Sam, aka uh, really through us, the taxpayers, you're still going to have to pay taxes because Uncle Sam still needs you know, the cut of the of that check as well. What do you think the biggest challenges are going to be for individuals as we start to file our taxes in this uh, 2020, 2021 year? I, I think you hit on a lot of it already. It's, it's there's so many things out there. Um, it, it's probably a better time than ever to, to, to go with a, a practitioner or, you know, if you have a less complex return, so, some sort of with the online filing software, because there's so much unknown. It, it takes, as you said, you know, around the clock vigilance to see all these changes that are going on. So, you know, be it one of the online ones or, or, or a firm like ourselves or so many others, you have to rely on someone who's, who's making it their job to know all these different changes and all the different nuances, because there's no way that the lay person or the general public could ever keep up. And with that, uh, as someone who's dedicated your, your life uh, in your career to numbers, uh, with that, when should an individual know it's best for them to do like the easy form or the online uh, tax return forms that have become so popular over the past few years or actually hiring an expert? It, it, it's largely based on feel. I mean, I, I do the free fillable forms online because I have familiarity you know, with, but you know, it, it's a place to start there. Once, once you get in there and it, if you have a level of, of discomfort, which happens to a lot of people, it's probably time to, to go to the experts because there's so much there and, and you can, even before, as you go in, you know, you're going to, to a certain extent, know your level of comfort. And if, if you feel overwhelmed, which so many people do, then there's a lot of great resources out there, be it in a firm or be it in, in the online softwares. Yeah, because with that too, with the age of the internet, how's it changed your industry? Uh, a great deal. I mean, we, we used to have a lot, a lot of small, you know, 1040 clients coming in just to do their individual, individual tax work. And a lot of those folks are going toward, you know, the online um, companies that are out there because it makes sense for them, you know, for, for an individual business standpoint, uh, the cost is relatively low. You know, if you have a complex return with a lot of tax planning to do, then it's certainly a good idea to keep going to the professional service firms. But for those who just, you know, have the more standard annual reporting, yeah, those, those online softwares are, are good. It's the more complex ones and those people who are more forward looking, that's when you really want to get involved with a practitioner who can do some, some good person to person work. So when should, uh, let's say if you have a married couple, when should they know to join, uh, to file jointly versus filing separately? I mean, the tax planning is usually good to do, you know, obviously before your end. Um, so if you work with a firm like Cohen or like any others, 
that, that's a good conversation to have usually in the November, December timeframe when, when we're doing those um, kind of tax planning discussions, you know, that's toward the top of the form. That's one of the first you know, decisions that has to be made before you get down into the nitty gritty of the actual numbers. I think so many people, when they get that tax form, when they start a job, they're confused. So they just fill out anything sure. <laughs> instead of really understanding what they're doing. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say again, I'm, I'm not a tax person, you know, within the firm, I'll defer to those folks. Um, but yeah, it, it is overwhelming. You see a lot of those options. It's easy to just um, default to what you think you should do. If you don't have the knowledge, that, that's when you go toward toward the resource provider, toward the people who do those things on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Adam Schultz with us here on the Megacast. He's the CPA and director for Cohen and Company. A confusing year for so many people, but you are the expert. What do you want the general public to know? Uh, there, there's a lot out there to choose from. Um, it's, planning is, is as key as it's ever been. So obviously, you know, the filing deadlines were extended last year, which helped out a lot of people as as the, the lockdowns and COVID exploded, you know, as the, around the time when the tax filing was going to happen, you know, we're not anticipating any extensions, so so the, the clock is ticking already. So if you haven't had, if you haven't taken a look at your individual situation or talked to your practitioner, then now, now is definitely the time to do so. Uh, we don't anticipate an extension into the summer like we had last year. So uh, April 30th, we'll be here before you know it. April 15th for the tax folks, uh, the, the time to act is now. Yeah, so uh, don't delay and try to get help. And so with that, um, is it really kind of backed up for so many people and so many companies right now to try to get in with a tax company? If you start to do it on your by yourself and you get a little confused, I, you know, is it hard to get appointments to uh, seek out that professional help? Uh, it, it certainly can be and it certainly will be as we get later into the season, you know, before that filing deadline. Um, it, it depends. Uh, obviously, existing clients for companies like ours um, are, are a big priority. Um, but at the same time, you know, we, we understand that there are new needs out there for people and, and we're willing to address those. But again, the, don't delay. The time to act is now. The further we get in and into the, the work that we're used to and toward the filing deadline, the, those opportunities and those open time frames really close up pretty fast. Adam Schultz with us here on the Megacast. Uh, anything I didn't maybe touch on that you want to share with our listeners and our viewers before we let you go? Uh, I, mean, I, I think the big topic is on the business side, those PPP loans. Um, round two is coming out, um, started on Monday um, for smaller banks and credit unions. Uh, that window um, for all borrowers is supposed to be opening up um, on uh, probably next week. That hasn't been confirmed yet from the SDA or from those banks, but um, it's, it's businesses, it's nonprofits, it's sole proprietors, uh, independent contractors. So there's going to be another $285 billion coming into the economy through the second round of PPP loans. There's money out there to be had. Um, if you borrowed before um, and you want to borrow again, as long as you have a 25% reduction in revenue for any quarter, you're able to go get a second loan. So again, a, roughly a quarter of a trillion dollars out there to be injected back into the economy for businesses and, and individuals. So that, that's out there, but again, the time to act is now, the window's already open, and for the, for the majority of businesses, it's gonna be open next week, uh, and money is expected to go pretty fast. Yeah, it, but it, just that, it does go very fast, and we, saw, we did see when the first round came out, uh, a lot of the bigger businesses were able to scoop those up before the small businesses were able to take advantage of some of those loans. Any advice to some of those individuals, the smaller businesses? Yeah, that, that was the main critique of, of the first round is that the, the bigger companies possibly who didn't even have the need were first to the window based on their, their existing banking relationships. So uh, basically that was a big part of what was baked into the second round is more targeted toward those um, smaller companies, those were, who were harder hit and those in lower income neighborhoods. So if you bank with a smaller bank or a credit union, the window to borrow could be open this week. Um, that was it's, a, it's an additional 15 billion and another 25 billion set aside strictly for small companies less than 10 employees or a loan smaller than 250,000. So if you are small, if you deal with a smaller bank, um, you have an opportunity right now to go and borrow where larger companies will move in probably next week. Uh, but regardless, even if you use a bigger bank, um, there's a lot of demand expected. So you know, talk to your bank right now, make sure that they're taking those round two applications 
and get your documentation in order right now in terms of payroll costs and in terms of the support for that reduction in business that is a requirement if you want your second loan. Oh, that is so important for so many of these small businesses to realize uh, that they can take advantage of it because so many of them are on the brink of closure if they haven't already done so. Great to have you with us here, Adam Schultz. Uh, he is the director for Cohen and Company. Great advice. We so appreciate your time. Thank you, Ronnie. Pleasure to be here. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast, uh, just over uh, 25 minutes left in the show, and we'll be rounding out the show with a little bit of fun on the agenda. Painting with a Twist is next on the Oakland County Megacast. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet Wear facial coverings when you leave your home and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. This may seem uncomfortable, but so is being hooked to an IV, sleeping in a hospital bed, and fighting for your life. When it comes to COVID-19, comfort is not as important as saving lives. Wearing a mask can greatly reduce the chance of spreading the virus. So mask up, Michigan, every time you leave home. We want to say thank you to the Bloomfield Chamber of Commerce for allowing us to live stream today's edition of the Megacast on their Facebook page. You can also catch us on Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access. Uh, if you have cable 99 on AT&T 15, if you have Comcast, you can also tune us into the radio 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, The Biff. If you've been unable to uh, catch the full show today or any of our previous episodes as well, we want to invite you to check out civiccentertv.com. If you click on the Megacast, you'll find the previous episodes going all the way back to past March of all of our interviews. And also we will uh, put clips of the interviews as well if you just missed one particular interview. With that, just about 20 minutes left here in the Wednesday edition of the Megacast. And for so many people, this was a huge thing to do uh, previous, prior to the pandemic was uh, the painting with a twist. And to be able to go out with your girlfriends and your friends, or even on a date night and enjoy a different type of event and expressing your creativity. But of course, everything has changed due to the COVID-19 crisis. With us now is going to be Jackie Cook. She's painting with a twist in Ferndale. Great to have you with us. Hi, Ronnie. Thank you so much for having us today. I'm very excited to be with you here. I will say I'm a little bit bummed because this was on my list of things to do. I had several girlfriends who did it and they had so much fun and then everything closed down. But are you reopened? What's the status currently for uh, Painting with a Twist there in Ferndale? Absolutely. So, you know, we did close down for most of the year. You know, we've been working with the current uh, kind of COVID orders and guidelines to kind of keep everything safe as best we can. So we are back open as of this month, but we are not allowing food or drinks. You know, that's the twist is that you're usually allowed to bring beer, wine and snacks with you. Right now, unfortunately, we can't have food in the building, but you can still come paint, listen to music and have a great time. So we've got something going on anyway. <laughs> yeah, but for us uncreative individuals, we could we could blame it on drinking the wine as to the reason why our painting didn't really turn out like it was supposed to turn out. 
I'm going to say that is the truth. It's always a good excuse. Um, you know, we are kind of moving into this year as well, offering virtual options. So that's a great way that you can kind of have the same experience or a similar experience while you paint at home and then you can use the wine as an excuse. <laughs> So uh, I do wonder, though, sometimes I see some of the contemporary art that's out there where they just maybe do some brush strokes or throw the paint on the canvas. And I think I can do that. Absolutely. You know, I find, uh, you know, even if you've never painted before, you're going to find a style that you like. You know, some people like to stay in the lines. Some people do like that messy kind of fun abstract thing. That's my personal favorite. So that's what I really encourage you to do is kind of try different styles of painting because you're going to find one that really works for you that you really enjoy doing. And so with that, it looks like you have um, a backdrop there in front of you. Yes. You, for those that think, oh my gosh, I can barely draw a stick figure. Could this be something they still enjoy? If I had a dollar for every time I heard someone say, I can't draw a stick figure, I would be a rich person. But I also know, having taught all of those people how to make a beautiful painting, that, you know, we can walk you through it. And that is what we are really great at is we are here for you to get you to that kind of creative spot where you can have fun with it. You know, we walk you through in little baby steps. You know, it's something that anyone can do. Um, you don't have to have an art degree to kind of understand how we walk you through the painting. Um, and that's the great thing is there's really not a lot of wrong or right when it comes to painting. So even if it looks a little bit different, that's what it's all about. So that's the fun thing. You'll see kind of everyone has their own personalities as they paint. Uh, Jackie, do you have paint by numbers? Like I remember those back when I was like, what, in first grade? <laughs> and yes. Put red here, put blue here. That I could get down with. You know, I always tell people that I'm your paint by numbers. So we do kind of tell you exactly that. But again, maybe you're not so constrained by all those lines. And it gives you the freedom to kind of, again, make it your own. So with that, Jackie Cook with us here on the Megacast. She is uh, with Painting with a Twist. Uh, so uh, tell us uh, the painting that you have there with you. Are you going to do yeah. a demonstration for so, us? Yeah, I was going to show you a little bit to kind of show you what it is like, especially in a virtual setting, because this is where I kind of my little home studio that we've been working out of for the summer and uh, now into the winter here too. But this is kind of what you'll see when you get one of our at-home kits. You'll get a video that kind of walks you through step by step. And it's the same thing in studio, you know, again, those little baby steps to get you to a great piece of artwork. So I'll show you a little bit here just to kind of show you the magic as it happens. Trees are one of my personal favorites to paint. They always remind me of like that Bob Ross style kind of stuff. So, you know, we would, again, break it down in little baby steps. We're going to tell you exactly which brush to use. We're going to tell you to pick up some black paint on your brush. And I'm going to point it with that skinny side up and down. And we're going to make a magic tree. We're just going to kind of go ahead. We're going to tap a nice long line kind of up towards our moon. And then we're going to turn our brush and cross it over. And we're just going to make fun tree. We're going to kind of zigzag back and forth. And as you keep working down that middle line, you are going to see your tree start to form. I always like to fill my trees in kind of full so they're nice and full and healthy. And then I'm just going to end up taking it all the way down here. And we're creating our nice forest here for our winter harvest moon forest that we're working on. So I could be doing that right now at the same time and my tree would not look like that. <laughs> you know, and that's the thing I always tell people, especially with trees, there's a lot of different species of trees. So if you have a different type of fir, that's all you got to tell people is that was your intention. It is your tree. Art is all about confidence. So that's 90% of it. <laughs> so yeah. with that, how long do these um, classes typically last? So our typical class when you come in studio is going to be a two hour session, you know, and that gives us time to kind of build things up. It gives you time to maybe take a break, wind down a little bit. We sometimes play some fun, fun games in our classes as well. And uh, when you walk out at the end of the two hours, you're going to have a beautiful painting. But is it going to be a painting that I could actually hang? <laughs> 
You know, honestly, it's so funny because, you know, uh, you can always find that spot for it. You know, even if it's the laundry room, I really encourage you to find somewhere to hang it up. I also always find maybe giving yourself, uh, you know, the benefit of the doubt that it's good. You know, everybody else is going to not see all the little flaws that you see. So I always say, hang it up and be proud. <laughs> uh, we, I come from a family of nine and I have a twin sister and we're the bottom, but then my brother right above us, He's the most artistic, talented individual. He's amazing, just absolutely amazing. And we say he sucked up all the talent. So <laughs> there was nothing left when it came to us. <laughs> you know, and that's, you know, that's one of those things, you know, we do hear that a lot, you know, they'll compare, you'll compare yourself to somebody in your family. Um, but again, it's, it's your own art. It's all about you, you know, and it can be a very cathartic experience. You know, maybe it's not totally about the end product, but maybe it's about like the time you spent doing it. So, you know, I think that's a kind of great way to look at art and nothing's ever perfect the first time you do it. So it takes practice makes perfect too, when it comes to painting. Can you teach someone to be artistic? I, you know, I think so. You know, it, it, it is one of those things that, you know, maybe you're super, you know, mathematical kind of people. Maybe they don't, aren't always going to be the first, you know, it's a little harder to come to them sometimes. But really, again, it's about skills, you know, and if you have like that vision in your mind, you know, it's really about just kind of learning the tips and tricks to kind of get you to be able to kind of repeat that image. So, you know, I think it is partially practice, but partially you just have to have an eye for beauty. <laughs> you know what, you were so cute there because you were trying to be very PC. Yeah. It's okay to say, no, some people just are going to sting. <laughs> some people have a worse time than other people. <laughs> but they do say art is in the eye of the beholder. Indeed Beauty is in is. the eye of the beholder. Oh, with that Jackie Cook with us, she's with painting with a twist. How does it work right now with your classes? Are they appointment only and are you limited, limiting the class size? Yep. So we're actually always by appointment only, even before the pandemic. You do want to make sure to kind of sign up ahead of time for your class just so that we can be prepared for you. You can actually look at our calendar of upcoming events if you visit our website um, and you can visit either of our locations. We've got one in downtown Ferndale and one in downtown Farmington as well. And it'll show you all of the paintings that we have. You would kind of select the painting and uh, the day and time we have them scheduled at. You'll see going on on there. Um, and uh, we also are offering curbside takeout take home kits where you get all of your supplies that you need and come pick it up at the studio and then you get to go paint at home as well. So with that when you when you say that you can pick kind of your painting do you get a blank slate or do you guys kind of give an outline as to what you're trying or attempting to recreate? You know it depends on the artwork so you know things like people, things that are going to look really strange if they're a little different. We usually give you a leg up. We have our tricks to kind of get you on the right track. So generally, if it's a person or something like that, uh, we will start you out with a little sketch to get you off on the right foot. For something like a landscape, you're probably going to start out with a blank slate, but don't let that scare you. Honestly, I think it sometimes makes it easier when you don't have those lines that you have to worry about. It really is all about the shading, though. I'm looking at your painting even now, and it's the different colors and the shading that makes it unique. You know, and that's, again, that's something unique is the right word for it, because, you know, we all have our brush own brush strokes, just like we have our own handwriting. So you're going to see everybody's brush strokes are a little different, um, but that's what makes it so cool. You'll also find it probably looks a little bit different in person than it does on camera. So, you know, you can always see, I think cameras do wonders for painting. So I always recommend as you're kind of enjoying yourself in painting to take some in-progress pictures as well. So Jackie, with that, you said, are you at your home studio right now? Yeah, I'm actually at my house right now. Yep. <laughs> so is that a, a blue screen behind you or a blue screen behind you? Or is that just the color of your wall? Because it matches your moon. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Uh, it, it's actually just my wall. Yeah, we kind of use it as a nice back, backdrop. You know, this has been uh, 
the first year that we're really doing this kind of take home and virtual stuff. So for our take home paintings, we've actually been creating along with our corporate um, offices, we've been creating these step by step videos. So again, it's a little different than we're used to doing it in person. So it's definitely been a transition. Um, but I have this kind of set up to do that. So this is kind of again, what you'll see um, with the step by step videos for those kids. But this is still kind of a good way for girlfriends to get together that haven't been able to connect to be able to do it, but or maybe a date night. Do you think this is something the virtual is going to be something that will stick around once we get out of the pandemic? You know, I definitely see it as something that's going to stick around for a while here. You know, we find, uh, you know, it's something that gives you options. You know, we do actually have uh, uh, some classes coming up. We've got a date night going on in not this Saturday, but next Saturday, where we're actually going to offer um, the paintings that are in studio. We're also going to offer those as a virtual class. We're actually going to do it over Zoom. So you'll have a little bit more of that interactive experience. But again, you can all do it from your safety of your own home. Jackie Cook with us here on the Megacast. Jackie, what have you learned uh, yourself personally during the pandemic? You know, I, you know, I think it's one of those things where we do have to, we have to stick together and work together. You know, I'm very grateful for our team at Painting with a Twist. You know, this is something that we've had to kind of be on our toes and figure out things as we go. So it's been really great having that flexible and reliable team. Um, and we're just kind of doing our best to keep everybody uh, busy. And, uh, you know, it's a, a lot of teamwork this year, I think. So with that too, have you seen an increase in the number of people maybe expressing themselves in artwork that, you know, because the pandemic, if anything, has given us more time. So there's no longer that excuse, one day I'm going to pick up that paintbrush or one day I'm going to learn how to draw. Have you seen more people uh, dip their toes and their artistic, you know, uh, aspirations during the pandemic. Absolutely, you know, and I think that whenever there's times of hardship, you know, that is a time that people do kind of lean towards artwork and things like that. So I definitely know some people personally that have really been spending time on their art during the pandemic. And also, you know, we have returned customers as well that, you know, have fallen in love with doing our at home kits and they really enjoy it. And, you know, we'll see their name every couple of weeks on our list for pickup. So it's, it's great to see that we can have that impact on kind of letting that happen for people. So Bob Ross used to say, happy little mistakes. <laughs> I wonder what he would say about the pandemic. <laughs> oh, you know, that's an interesting, interesting thing. He would probably have something beautiful to say about the pandemic. So I wish he was here for that. <laughs> he was really fascinating to watch Absolutely. on the, all the, those PBS specials. Who's inspired you? You know, honestly, I would say Bob Ross is a big inspiration. Um, you know, I'm inspired just by the world around me and the resilience of all of the people that I meet daily, you know, and that's something that I definitely miss with not having the in-person classes. I'm really just doing virtual right now. And it's that human connection of, you know, all of our people in the, this area are just, you know, I've met so many wonderful people over the years. So I think people are my inspiration. <laughs> Gosh, I so miss people, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> I never thought I would say that, but I really do. <laughs> so true. Jackie Cook with us. She's with Painting with the Twist out of Ferndale. Uh, before we let you go, Jackie, if someone wants to sign up for a class or do the curbside um, event as well, how can they do so? Perfect. Um, so the best place to look for information and also to either sign up for an in-person class or place an order for our curbside pickup for our take-home kits is just to visit our website. It's www.paintingwithatwist.com and you can either search Ferndale or Farmington, our two locations. Um, we generally do pick up uh, at Farmington on Thursdays and we do pick up for Ferndale on Fridays. So you just want to order by the day before. And again, for our in-person classes, check out our calendar. You'll see all of our lovely paintings that we have going on. We've got stuff for kids. We've got stuff for, again, a girl's night out and we've got those date nights coming up. So. Um, uh, we would love to see you in. And if you're interested in booking a private party, we're also kind of working on those as well, both in studio and on Zoom. 
So what that, uh, what's involved in the curbside kit and what's the cost as well? Perfect. So um, the kits are $35 per kit. Um, you get your canvas, you get brushes, paints, uh, paper plate, you get napkins, apron, and a cup to put your water in. The only thing that's not included is an easel to prop up your canvas on. They are optional, but we have two options for you. We've got cardboard easels for $3 additional, and we've got wooden easels for $10 additional. That is great. And for that amount of money, I mean, especially since you can't go eat in a restaurant right now, yep. this is great to be able to bring it home and uh, do a virtual night with either your girlfriends, your friends, or your spouse. Although I, I, my husband's actually a really good drawer. I, <laughs> would want to, he'd want to be comic book related though. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, it's funny. You know, we'll have guys, you know, do, you know, maybe you guys paint a landscape, but then like Bigfoot ends up in their side. But I find the guys have a ton of fun with it. Um, we're also offering a special for the month of January where you buy 10 kits, you get two free. We're calling it our 12 person party pack. So if you do have a little bit of a larger group, you know, you can always do a Zoom call together as you paint. Um, and just, just so you know that we've got that special going on as well. Well, Jackie, you're very talented uh, just from the fact that you did that tree, which looks great in like two seconds. <laughs> yeah, I was going to paint a little bit more. It was going to be more of a forest down here. We actually have this one coming up on Sunday, and we also have this one available in the at-home kits. Okay, great. Uh, Jackie, anything maybe we didn't touch on that you want to uh, share with our listeners and viewers before we let you go? You know, again, I just want to thank you so much for having us out. I also want to thank you from our owner, Michelle Lewis. Uh, she has, again, been my we're our right hand and the left hand for painting with is host right now. And again, it's uh, all about teamwork. So I just want to give her a shout out to being a great owner. Oh, that's great. That's great that you enjoy what you do too. You can tell you love it. So Absolutely. well, we wish you, uh, you and your team the best as well. And for anyone out there who has thought about possibly um, you know, expressing themselves through art, this is a perfect way to do it. Fantastic. We hope we can, you can paint with us soon. <laughs> we hope so too. We're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast and then wrap up the show when we continue. This is the Oakland County Megacast. The only way to beat COVID-19 is to face it. You can't get too comfortable. You can't forget the danger. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wear the mask. Wash your hands. Keep a safe distance. Especially in the next few months. You know we'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. We'll get back to normal. Someday. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But not yet. But not yet. Consider virtual gatherings for the holidays. Curbside food order. Grocery delivery. And shopping local. Shop local. And especially shopping local. Let's beat this virus. We can if we face it together. 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 For the latest information, visit oakgov.com forward slash COVID. We're sorry we weren't able to bring you the interview today with uh, Representative Levin. Hopefully we can get him a little bit uh, later in the week. Obviously it's understandable right now because the U.S. House of Representatives are right now beginning proceedings to impeach President Donald Trump for the second time, something that has absolutely never been done in the history of the United States. We will continue to watch that as well. We also want to remind people that the governor is expected to talk uh, at noon today regarding the issue of opening up restaurants for indoor dining. Tyler, uh, are you going to be able to have that interview, that press conference uh, to share with the public? Yes, we will have that for the public. We will go, we will end the show here as we normally do at 12 noon sharp and then uh, within about 30 seconds to a minute after the top of the hour it's right around the time where the governor usually is speaking during these press conferences we'll take that live for you we'll do a short break after we officially close the show uh, with our station identification and all the, and all that you'll probably hear a public service announcement and then we'll come back and i'll send it straight to the governor 
You know, I'm excited. I believe we're going to have Professor Dulio on with us tomorrow morning on the Megacast yes. uh, to get his take uh, on everything that is happening. I remember the last time we spoke to him, Tyler, before the new year, and it was like, what else could happen? <laughs> oh, my right. goodness gracious. We have a lot to talk to him about tomorrow on the show, and we'll see how the proceedings continue because as a reminder, as they are ongoing, the proceedings, uh, they will not actually get to the Senate um, if uh, until President Trump is out of office. So I would really like uh, his information and his expertise as we continue to watch the events unfold in the nation's capital. Yeah, it'll be interesting to hear from him, uh, see whether or not they will even send those articles of impeachment should they be passed, and they most likely will in the House of Representatives today, if they'll even send that to the Senate before the Senate uh, reconvenes uh, after the inauguration, or just before, the day before the inauguration. And with that, we should also note that security is extremely tight, not only yes. in Washington, D.C., but also at capitals across the country, including here in Lansing. As we come up one week from today, President or uh, President elect Biden will be uh, sworn in as the next president of the United States. Security extremely tight across the country, as well as in the nation's capital following the events that we did see unfold last week. The big thing is just to be safe and to stay healthy as we continue to navigate this pandemic. That's going to wrap it up for the Wednesday edition of the Oakland County Megacast, but we do want to say thank you to everyone for taking time out of your day to share a little bit of it with us today. This has been the Oakland County Megacast.